morning guys, welcome to my channel. Today we're in Potchefstroom in northwest province of South Africa and we've got a very cool species, very unique species of snake here. We've come to visit Arne Pretorius and he's a local Rinkholz wrangler and snake rescue of the area and he's doing really amazing things out here. So we're very lucky that he's got three rescued Rinkholz so that we can show you guys this amazing species of snake. So he's sitting over here in this tub so let me get him out. I'm pretty sure he's going to be wide awake and ready to hood for us. So here we have the wrinkles, it's Hemochatus, Hemochatus, and it's a monotypic species. It's the only one within the species, but they resemble very much cobras. As you can see, the hooding and the body structure is very similar to a cobra. They are a sister species, so they're actually very similar in essence to the king cobra. A lot of people think king cobras are cobras, but they're not from the true Naja genus. Now the reason for these guys not being part of the Naja genus is because of their very unique differences to cobras. They've got keeled scales, which means they've got little ridges alongside their scales here, which gives them a very rough appearance. Now, Rinkhals is from the Dutch derivative, where it means banded or ringed-necked cobra. And obviously it's not a cobra, but it's a suitable name considering that they've got these two white bands along a very black belly with this beautiful iridescence. They range from about 90 centimeters to about 1.2 meters, up to maybe 1.5. And Arne was actually telling me that someone recently caught about a 1.72 meter wrinkles, which would be an absolute beast of a snake. They've got really stocky heads compared to cobras. These snakes usually inhabit very grassy wetland areas throughout Southern Africa, all the way from Cape Town, Eastern Cape, up to Gauteng, with populations actually within Johannesburg, which is incredible, meaning they're very adaptable to urban environments alongside dams and rivers and ponds, and they have variation within their distribution as well. Up here in the northern side of their distribution, they're more black and gray colors, and with their keeled scales, it really gives them almost like a gunmetal look whereas down in the Eastern Cape and uh, the Western Cape, they get more bandy with these oranges and yellows coming through the bands. Really, really beautiful individuals. This is a more drib and drab kind of specimen, but at the same time, still a very, very cool snake. And as you can see, he's shamming death now. He's opening his mouth and there he wakes up. Straight away, you see how quickly it can change. There's a little spit and they're back to dead. So those are there straight away, your three defensive mechanisms of this snake. That's their first mechanism is to be able to get away. So they'll immediately try and slither away from humans. They like to bask during the day. There's actually a little bit of a different opinion as to whether these snakes are fully diurnal or whether they're nocturnal, considering their favorite prey items usually come around the early hours of the morning and early hours of night, all the way through the night time is when frogs and amphibians are mostly active. So I would assume that these snakes would be active during that same period. But we've noticed with a couple species of snake as we've done this expedition throughout South Africa with different species, that during different periods of the year, whether it's really, really hot during the day and snakes are unable to be active, they will become more nocturnal. And then when it's really, really cold periods of the year, they'll become more diurnal. So again, I think a little bit more studies can be done into that to find out whether these guys are fully nocturnal, but I would assume that they're pretty um, opportunistic in that way. They will be active when their food is active and when the right environmental conditions are there. So then, second technique is, hasn't gotten away from the human or from the dog or whatever it might be escaping from, will be to hood up. Hood up, it'll show a big hood, make itself look really big. They can lift up over half of their body length and make a very big hood. It's super, super, super impressive. So let's see if this guy will do a little bit of a hood. And we can see how impressive this snake is. He's straight away shamming death again. 
So shaming death is called thanatosis, which is a technique a lot of animals use to pretend and play possum. Just play dead, you look and you see a dead snake, you pick it up, see it's opening its mouth even more as I'm touching it, rolling over on its belly. And this is when these snakes become really dangerous for people who don't know, children want to go and pick up the snake, and that's when the snake tags you. So now there's also a little bit of discussion going on as to the spitting technique of this type of snake. Now spitting cobras, like the Mozam spitter, are able to actually spit from horizontal position. So it can just have its head slightly lowered off the ground and still fire out the venom. Now these guys still have contractions of their venom glands, but to be able to aid in a precise hitting of a target, they tend to flick their bodies forward during the contraction of the venom, which we've seen in some footage. As they're contracting the venom, it starts shooting out the bottom. It is a 90 degree front fixed fang and instead of straight down, it's got a 90 degree angle. So they can already do contractions. We see the venom coming out of the fangs at a lower angle, and as it lifts its head and flicks forward, that's when the venom actually gets directed. So the venom is already being squeezed out. The flick is just to kind of help propel and direct the venom towards the aggressor's eyes and face. They can be quite accurate up to two, two and a half meters in distance, and that's their majority or their primary defense mechanism is to spit. They're really, really good spitters and they tend to spit a hell of a lot, but they're also very conservative with their venom. Because it's a protein, they have to synthesize that venom and it takes a lot of energy for a snake to produce that stuff. So they tend to be very, very cautious when they're using their venom. They like to save it for when they actually need to feed and when they need to use the venom for keeping themselves nice and healthy. So in terms of spitting, there's a little bit of misunderstanding with these snakes but they are really, really good spitters and they can be called ring-necked spitters or the collared spitting cobra. So you can see they're very reactive, very quick to take their moment and opportunity to try and bite, but as well as also try and get away. You can see now if I were to let him go, he's gonna cruise off and try to get away from me. Snakes are not out to get you. These guys' first reaction will be to slither away and get away, but the problem is they do enjoy urban environments, ponds and bodies of water where humans inhabit, so we often cross paths, and that's the biggest problem with these snakes. So there is a um, very good antivenom produced here in South Africa, polyvalent antivenom that is very effective. There have been almost no reported deaths since 1950, there was a reported case of a seven-month-old infant that got bitten and unfortunately died. Deaths from this is very, very, very rare. You would need to get a heavy envenomation, no medical treatment, and be of quite a small body size. Because of the cytotoxic venom, if you're a big enough person, the venom tends to dilute throughout your body and you generally are okay. With probably some necrosis, depending where you got bit, amputation of fingers and toes and things like that is a possibility with a snake like this. So really not a pleasant bite, but not a fatal bite, considering that the polyvalent antivenom is so effective. In Costa Rica, they're actually doing huge, amazing work to be able to alleviate snake bites across the world. In Clodomirio Picado University, they're busy designing an antivenom for this species, as well as many other species, from Australian snakes to Indian snakes, and producing high quality antivenom that will actually be effective. A lot of African antivenom is produced in India for North Africa and is highly ineffective against the species that get bitten, hence the big, big problem and lack of hospitalization and effectiveness of snake bite in Africa. In India, it's even worse with over 100,000 cases of snake bite. And again, a lot needs to be done in this realm to be able to alleviate this huge issue that we have globally with snake bite and perceptions of snakes. These guys are specialists, toad and frog eaters, but also generalists and won't say no to a rodent, won't say no to another snake, 
or geckos or lizards or whatever they can get their mouths on. The babies, actually juveniles, are known to eat reptile and frogs eggs. So as they grow older, their prey item size will get bigger and bigger. And then they're also oviviparous, giving birth to live young. Anywhere between 25 to 30 little individuals will come out. They breed during the winter months from about May through to August. And then they have a gestation period of about five to six months, which is quite a long period. Now the babies will come out fully formed and little carbon copies of their parents and they usually come out with a little bit more banding which they lose as they age. It's a very, very, very cool species of snake, super unique and great to work with. This is a rescued snake and you can see Arne has actually been looking after him. He's got quite a big belly injury there from the wild as well as a bit of a cleft lip going on there. But these are natural wild injuries and not created by humans. So we'll pull out a second rescue that Arne has got and these will all be released within the next couple of days. So here we have a slightly smaller one which is really cool to see the color difference. This one is a lot browner, a creamy color, but a lot more jumpy and a little bit harder to handle as most small snakes can be. Let's grab the tail there and see if this guy will play ball. So here we have a more juvenile wrinkles and you can see the color difference on the body there. It's a much browner color than that bullet gunmetal gray and he's hooding up his little hood, making himself look bigger. This is about just short of a meter, so but still a very cool little snake. So guys, thanks for watching. Here we have the amazing wrinkles from Southern Africa, really a unique species of snake. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notifications bell, and remember to stand for what we stand on.